Hey everyone, how's everyone doing? Good. So two of you are doing good, all right. How are the rest of you then? All right. All right, let's get this going. I'll think. It has to uh, call the chat GPT API. This is uh, very advanced stuff. All right. Is this working? Yes, it is. All right. How are we doing, everyone? In the rear view, React in 2022. Did we enjoy 2022? <laughs> what was wrong with 2022? Everything. What's everything? Who said that? What's, what's everything? What's wrong? Code related or uncode related? Code related or uncode related? Both. Ah, OK. Well, take half of that and throw it out the window, because we're not going to talk about that. That's between you and your therapist. <laughs> Here, we're going to get a little therapy session, a cleansing therapy session. We're going to just have a fun talk. We're going to look back at the year review of React. Now, the asterisk here, of course, because there's a lot to cover in 2022, as my friend in the front row has, of course, uh, let us know. Um, so this will be only the API, the core API related, and really only the, the big things that I can cover in what I have is a lightning talk. So uh, we got about 20 minutes for this. So come along with me for the ride, because there were so many other things besides the core API changes that were announced. I mean, Remix. Anyone here use Remix? Show of hands. We got one. I can literally count them on one hand. One, two. Is this in production or just like, has no one messed with Remix at all? OK, if you've, if you've deployed a Hello World app with Remix, raise your hand. All right, why didn't you use it in production? Shout it out. Job. Job. <laughs> Bosses. Suits, right? Bastards. <laughs> but we had a lot of interesting stuff happen. And of course, the Shopify team, famous for their hydrogen framework, acquired them. Now, there's been a lot of speculation as to why this happened and what they're actually going to do. Um, if anyone's seen an announcement of why they did this, let me know. Uh, but I haven't seen it yet, so speculation is about it. But I think it has something to do with e-commerce. Uh, the, release, the release of Tan Stack Router. Um, this was uh, by Tanner Lindsley, one of the foremost engineers in our ecosystem that we all know and love. And if you don't, uh, you, should, you, should, you should know and love him. He's lovable. Um, really amazing stuff. This is a uh, fully type safe uh, router for React, and it's really, really amazing. And then TRPC, of course, which allows us to build type safe APIs fast that are easy to build, fun, and scalable. And then just, there's just so much more, but of course, today I'm going to talk about the React Core API because React in 2022 is fundamentally different from any other time that came before it. And in order to understand this, we need to understand what happened in 2020. So on December 21st, 2020, Dan Abramov and Lauren Tan, uh, two members of the React team, the React core team at, is it Meta or Facebook? I'm pretty sure it's Meta now. At Meta, they introduced React server components. React server components. And this is where they announced that they will be moving computation from the device to the server, or as Marcel likes to point out, to the edge. Now, this allowed developers to perform data fetching at the component level. This proposal would prove to be an absolute game changer. Special functions like get static props and get server side props no longer needed. Instead, we can just write plain JavaScript function that uses fetch and then await that result of that function directly inside the component. So you can co-locate data. So you can co-locate data fetching with your components. Server components also give developers the choice on where components render, either the client or the server. However, at the time, as you can see from this Next.js product directory, um, if you really wanted to get a React server component, you would have to append .server.js uh, to, to 
you get those advantages. And since React server components are opt-in, we can actually mix server components and client components across our tree. And this really shows the end goal of how the React team is thinking about this. So React server components were announced in December of 2020. Would it be ready anytime soon? How about next year? 2021, this guy's favorite year. No, we got a big nothing burger, right? We got a bunch of tumbleweeds. What about 2022? This has got to be the year. Well, March 29th, 2022, React 18 was released as a stable version on NPM. Okay, surely we get React server components on the stable version of React 18, which they've been working on for like, what is it, like a decade, right? <laughs> it's been a while. Um, but nope, sorry, can't have that. React server components is still in development. Okay, so when would we get them? Enter next JS. Because it turns out that we could expect a release very soon. In the summer of 2022, the next JS team uh, and Andrew Clark of the React team, as you can see here from his Twitter, ACD Light, uh, which is the lighter version of his ACD Dark. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, previewed what's to come in the next release of Next.js. Andrew even described this as the real, quote unquote, um, React 18, but I should qualify this for Next.js users, which uh, we'll come back to in a little bit. Then we come to Next.js Conf 2022, October 25th, not too long ago. Where all matter of things were introduced, but notably, Next.js 13. Next.js 13 not only provided out-of-the-box support for React server components, but it made it dead simple to do so. Just add a new um, directory app, and every page in the directory operates as a server component by default. And as Guillermo announced here, you can even incrementally adopt this. So you can do one page at a time. And many of you may be thinking, this is great, but why does React server components rely on Next.js? Is, is anyone else puzzled by this question? Yes. <laughs> so immediately following Next.js conf, we saw a lot of criticism from the community. Talks of favoritism. React being inextricably linked to Next.js and exclusive insider access, some people would argue. A large portion of this criticism was taken from a statement made by Andrew Clark on stage during a panel at Next.js Conf following the keynote, where he said, Next.js 13 is the real React 18 release. And Theo was there. Theo was live tweeting, a lot of updates. Go check out that uh, thread, really great, if you want to get just synopsis without actually watching the video. But this tweet, 18 quote tweets, which Mr. Musk broke. I can't see who actually quote tweeted that. I don't know about you. Let me know if it works for any of you, because I'd, I'd like to see that and inspect that. Or get a third party app. Someone want to build that? Codex, you want to build another fake app? <laughs> so it caused a lot of controversy. But Andrew himself was quick to correct the record. I should have said for Next.js users. It's not the real React 18 release, period. It's that we can actually show you the entire React ecosystem of what our vision is for this. And again, referencing the tweet he made for July, clarifying that he meant for Next.js users. And Jeff Escalante, just to drive the point home, was also quick to dispel some of these accusations. When people cried favoritism, he pointed out that many other teams were invited to work directly with the React team, but they declined for various reasons including difference of opinion of how and if to use React server components. But I'm not here to take sides. I'm just reporting what I saw based on publicly available information. There's probably a lot more to the story as there always is, but that's how I saw it. But I think the person who had the best take on this was none other than the God himself 
Dan Avermaugh brought a very nuanced, level-headed approach to this that provided a lot of context for us. And this is, this is a long tweet storm, but I think, so you're not gonna get all the context here, but I think it's worth to actually literally read this. So bear with me as we go through this because I think this is really important that we should all know. So Dan says, while the goals are easy to understand, provide an idiomatic data fetching solution, it turns out that many different concerns are interconnected. How you do data fetching is related to routing, code splitting, streaming, loading indicators, hydration, bundling, and so on. Typically, this is where frameworks come in. Frameworks provide opinionated stacks of solutions that solve these problems in a cohesive way. Every framework can offer a different take, and they can compete on features, fall differently on the convention versus configuration scale, etc. However, if the only common denominator between frameworks is React, the library, and its APIs like UState, we leave many potential improvements on the table. If each framework wraps React in a completely different way, we can't do deep fundamental cross-cutting improvements. So what is, what is he saying here? He's saying we need to start somewhere. <laughs> That's what he's saying. He's saying, now back to Next.js. I'm excited about this release because it's the most comprehensive generalized attempt to implement the React architecture so far. It shows how all the pieces, streaming HTML, server components, routing with partial refetching, bundling, can connect together. So he's, he's showing us that you have a dream for what React can be. And he's saying, we finally have an opportunity to show the community what it actually can do. And this is partnering with Next.js. So he says, I'm sure the Next.js implementation will give us more insights to feedback into the React architecture. Just like feedback from Hydrogen, the framework from Shopify, and Remix, also the framework from Shopify again, now, ugh, now, already shake parts of it. I'm thankful to every maintainer helping us explore these ideas across frameworks and companies. This architecture does not yet have answers for every use case, but I deeply believe in its promise and potential. Ultimately, it has to compete on its own merits, but within and outside the React ecosystem. If we do our job well, I hope to see more frameworks adopted. So this is, again, a really nuanced take from Dan that I think we can all appreciate. Um, Dan, if you're watching this, can we all give him a round of applause for like just clearing the air? And I recently had the opportunity to sit down with Tom Okino to discuss this subject. Does anyone know who Tom is? So you, you should, because he's really responsible for React. He helped to create it. Tom started on the team, on the, on the MooTools team, um, where he was, he was friends with Christoph Nakazawa and even Sebastian Mark Boge, both of whom were also on the React core team. And MooTools was almost like the, the early inspiration, uh, the precursor to React. Um, and this is where that team really connected, and Tom worked with um, all the folks at Facebook in the early days to really champion and really communicate React to the world because it's a hard thing to communicate this pattern change coming from the world of jQuery and everything else coming to uh, React land. And so he was one of those folks who helped to uh, communicate React to the world. He was also directly responsible for the full rewrite of Facebook.com to React, um, which if you're not aware is the largest application in the world. So it's kind of a big deal to be able to do that without it actually like crashing and burning. Um, so this past December, on December 14th, we did a little holiday party um, and I had the opportunity to sit down with him and talk with him about the entirety of his career because he, he left Facebook, or yeah, he left Facebook, he didn't leave Meta, he left before the name change. So he left Facebook um, in 2021, mid-2021. So I asked him, I said, why did it take two years to ship React server components into production? And Tom said, the reason it took so long to ship React server components into production is that every test we ran, it was worse performance-wise. The issue wasn't the amount of JS we were shipping, it was the amount, it was the implementation details on the way that our servers would call back to our JavaScript engine. So we didn't know that it was going to be better. So the reason the JS, so the reason the JS bundle size is not the biggest problem at Facebook was because the application code weighed so much more than library code. So server components addresses this because all the things that are static should have been static HTML anyways. And so I went further on to it and I asked him, 
why React server components shipped with Next.js first, which is, of course, the topic at hand. And Tom replied, there was never any first party implementation of anything beyond server rendering. And you need more than server rendering in order to change the game. So Next was a great place to say, hey, we have control of the server, we have control of the client, now we can finally get them talking to each other. So here for Tom and the React team, it's a matter of convenience. But it's also a matter of alignment, where there were differences of opinion with folks like Remix and Shopify. With their hydrogen framework, there was alignment between the Next team and the React team. On the future of other libraries, Tom said that other libraries will likely integrate this into their workflow as well. But this is just the first place where you can see the full vision of React together in one spot. And even Grayson from the Gatsby team acknowledged that they're working with the React team to integrate React server components into Gatsby. And even Josh Larson, he's from the Shopify team, uh, acknowledged that while they did not integrate React server components into Hydrogen apps, he praised Next.js 13 for building React server components the right way. And so we're just getting started with React server components. This is a new, exciting chapter for React. It's making React apps faster, more accessible, and easier to maintain. And it started with Next.js, but it, it doesn't end there. And I'm really excited to talk to you about all of this when we break and see how you're working with uh, React server components and how you're integrated into your stacks. Uh, but before we get there, I'd like to mention one more major announcement uh, relative to the core React API. And that's first class support for promises and async await. I'm out of time, so I'll cover this very briefly. Um, with the async React component, the await is in the body with a complete lack of any loading states, effects, hooks, or libraries. It just works. And you can use this component anywhere in your tree, even if the component isn't itself async. So this concept builds on, upon React Suspense, and the goal is to make React Suspense easier to use. And I think they accomplished that goal. Secondly, if you want to render on the client, we now have a use hook. This makes it easier to build asynchronous code without having to leverage third-party tools like React Query, now known as Handstack Query. And as Andrew himself mentions in his proposal, which is his code here, use has a special ability that other hooks do not. Calls can be nested inside conditions, blocks, and loops, which allows you to conditionally wait for data to load without splitting your logic into separate components. Both of these methods are a fundamental change for how you get data into your components, either to employ async await, or if, if you're running on the server, or to employ the new use hook if it's client rendered. And to learn more about this, I suggest going to the actual proposal itself here on that GitHub pull request. And also check out this talk, 12-minute uh, video by Theo Brown. Uh, he's over at t3.dg on YouTube. Uh, really good comprehensive overview. Some attribution and resources for some of the code and examples I've shown here, the Next.js docs, the React beta docs. If you haven't checked those out, it has a lot of updates from the original docs. Uh, hopefully that we should ship in that as a 1.0 soon. Um, Theo Brown, incredible YouTuber, some hot takes, but really smart. Uh, Swizek Teller, great newsletter, Fireship, Fire Videos, and Andrew Clark, uh, his, his proposal on GitHub. All right, and how about one more thing? Again. Um, so I'm the organizer of Reactathon. Uh, that's the San Francisco React Conference, which is the largest independently organized React conference in the US. Uh, and last year, we were at the most beautiful venue I've ever seen. Uh, this is an outdoor amphitheater in San Francisco's East Bay. This isn't even a pro photograph. This is by one of our, one of our uh, attendees uh, be between a break just before a talk started. Um, it's just such a spectacular experience. 
Um, but this year, we are coming back to San Francisco proper, uh, but we're not going to be downtown like most of your conferences. Uh, we're not going to be in a hotel. We're going to be in Pacific Heights. Uh, Pacific Heights, as the name suggests, very high up in elevation. You get lots of these lovely views. Our venue is right between two city parks. Look kind of like this, you get some incredible views and just absolutely stunning architecture. Um, so I'm really excited for that to happen. Uh, if you're interested in the kind of talks we feature at uh, Reactathon, oh hi. It's trippy, man, yeah. <laughs> All right, I would suggest going to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash realworldreact. Check out these two talks from David Korshid. Um, David is a former engineer at Microsoft, now founder at Stately. And he gave a talk called Goodbye Use Effect. He's basically saying we are all using Use Effect incorrectly <laughs> and misusing it. So that was really interesting. And Ryan Florence gave an absolute stunner of a talk talking about remixing React Router and also uh, look for the Easter egg where he calls out Lee Robinson from the Rizal team about nested routes. It's, it's, pre it's pretty nice. Um, on our YouTube channel, we also have the full talk with my full talk with Tom. Uh, really interesting if you're interested in hearing about the history of, of React. We touch a little bit of that, but then we also talk a lot of contemporary subjects. Um, also, what he's up to now and uh, if he's excited for the future or not. Um, and then we also had at that same uh, holiday party, uh, B Dougie from uh, GitHub interviewed Theo, uh, Theo Brown um, and uh, Max Stoiber uh, from Stellate. Uh, they had a discussion on TRPC and GraphQL, and that, that's an absolute, another banger of, <laughs> of a discussion. Um, so I would encourage you to also check that out if you're interested. And then do the like and subscribe, of course. Yeah, that's how you do it. So that thing, uh, one more thing, as promised, uh, is this guy. Scan it and find out. <laughs> Guess is what this is? A what? It is a yes. You get the you get the AirPods Pro. Seventeen. When they come out. So this is a secret reg link for you. For Reactathon 2023 happening in San Francisco on May 2nd and 3rd. Um, and this is a 15% off discount code. So even if you don't wanna buy now, take a picture of this, because uh, that's, that's gonna be gone soon. There's only a few, few tickets left. We shared this with our newsletter. Anyone else wanna take photos? I'll send an email afterwards. Yeah, 50%. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I do the intro after the talk. So my name is Benjamin Dunphy. Uh, you can reach me on, you can follow me on Twitter at Benjamin. Uh, that's my name pronounced phonetically in Spanish. Um, my email is Ben at Real World React, and I'm a DevRel consultant. We do field marketing, event production, conference production, and video production. And that's the one time I wore a suit at my wedding, so I figured make it a profile picture for a while. Um, okay, that's my talk. Thanks, everyone.